A um, couple words. This lady right here in the second row, just little sparks. I'm not saying I'm a prophet, but the Bible does say you can all prophesy. So. And by the way, I got two words. You're maybe three, but uh, they're really for, I think, multiple people. Um, so just take it as it comes, and if it shoe fits, you know, something like that. I, the word came to mind, the verse came to mind from Psalm. says he's the glory and the lifter of my head. He likes to be the help of our countenance, and he likes to come alongside and bring the sunshine into our lives. And he might sing something like, you are my sunshine, my only sunshine. He may sing that over you. I think he does. Yeah. So Lord bless her in Jesus' name. Some of you probably need to hear something like that, like maybe over here. And so this guy right here, James, talked to you a little bit earlier, and the word coming to my mind was, He's, God's the God of second chances. I have a friend who uh, many years ago, as a young man, he tried to step into the ministry and he stubbed his toe and he kind of got in trouble. And some big dog ministry guy came and says, well, that disqualifies you. You'll never be in ministry again. And you'll never, uh, you'll never you know, amount to anything because you've got this thing on your, on your uh, uh, record. But the cool thing is, He's a pastor of probably one of the largest uh, churches in Quad Cities, uh, um, up uh, Rock Island, Moline, Davenport, Iowa, on the Mississippi River up there. And uh, still a friend. Uh, I've visited his church a couple of times. I'm not saying you're supposed to be a pastor. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying God is the God of second chances. And he who is faithful and little shall be given authority over much, James. And so, hey, did that shoe fit anybody else in here? So God's a God of second chances. Some of you have done some dumb stuff, You're boneheaded, you know, crazy, like, uh, and you can't hardly forgive yourself, but God is the God of second chances. I declare that over you in Jesus' name. Now believe it and receive it and shake the stuff off, okay? We're going for it. Okay, good deal. Uh, Sean and uh, Misty, is she here? Yep, good deal. I just uh, got a lot of kudos for you. I just feel like uh, the Lord is really proud of you. Uh, you're an outpost here, uh, hosting and nurturing and exporting the uh, freedom of the generosity of the Lord to not only uh, 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 displaying and, uh, and speaking of the goodness of the Lord's heart, but identifying the, uh, the true identity of God's people. And so I just blessed you. I just uh, felt like fresh new things uh, would come and I'm kind of, I'm tossing several things around in my mind here. I believe with all my heart we're coming into a fresh new age and this is not like just a new season. This is like epic changes, like B.C. to A.D., that epic. And it's going to require some major changes, like we can't do things church as normal. And as good as this is, uh, 10 years and 20 years from now, I think we've, we're going to be radically different. And I believe you're a man and a woman who are serious. You're going after it. You said in the first service, if this is all there is, you know, uh, humanly, we'd want to just say, okay, I'll change my expectations and go with that. But no, a thousand times no. There is more. There is more. And God, Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. So not only do I bless you with that, but I call it forth. The Bible says God is a God who calls forth those things which are not as though they were. And so, Lord Jesus, I just call forth into this congregation through this ministry and those who would touch this ministry a brand new grace that would open up fresh new doors that would uh, make available the graces of God, the life of God, the new epic, the new era of Christianity. And you would be forerunners of that in Jesus' name. In fact, uh, I believe Micah 2.13 will be descriptive of you. It says, and there are those who go forth and find a gate, and they go forth, and many come behind them with God or at the head, with the Lord at their head. So uh, breakers, those who find gates, those who find open doors and move through and open a way for those to follow. So Lord, just bless them that uh, the angelic, yes, the angelic, who are sent to minister to those who are in inherit salvation, Lord, would minister to them in abundance. If you could feed Elijah raisin cakes, angels, if you could minister to Jesus, 
And you're sent to minister to those who inherit salvation. And you camp around those who fear him. And you gird us up lest we dash our foot against a stone. Lord, we speak all of those and much more from the angelic resource and asset from the throne room to come over Sean and Misty and over this ministry and over all the families represented, Lord, to escort them into fresh new adventures and vistas that are so exhilarating that, like, Lord, this is what we came to the kingdom for. Amen. Yeah. So uh, we were down in uh, Clinton at the well maybe earlier this year, I think. Does that sound right? A bunch of you guys came down? Something like that. Maybe it was last fall. I'm not sure. And while there, God showed up in, in some fun ways, uh, and some were unusual. Some had gold dust on their hands, and somehow found feathers in their seats and around them. And uh, sometimes I ask people, you know, we talk about this, and then they just kind of, oh, I'm okay, whatever. I said, well, are you looking? Are you expecting it? You know? So they start looking, hey, look, you know. Well, just start looking around. The cool thing is, oh, gosh, I, you know, just so many fun ways we could go. But I keep a little portfolio of crazy fun stuff that God does. I just, you know, I'm good at like memorial stones. Just kind of get it around me so that my heart is not only marinated, but so that I can export it. I can give it to people. In fact, I'll just pass this around. You can't keep it, though. <laughs> but I say that to say this. I want to tell a story. That is, those are pictures of crazy stuff that's happened or significant memorial stones, memory stones of things that have happened, gemstones, gold dust, uh, glowing leaves. Uh, that'll intrigue you. I hope you're still with me after that one. And feathers and just crazy stories, you know. So anyway, I just... I just decided I'm going to build and fortify my life with the goodness of God so that I don't uh, easily fall off the wagon. You know what I'm saying? I, I want to make it really difficult for my heart to get out of faith. Yeah. So I'm going to tell a story, and it's going to lead me into this. So speaking of crazy stuff, uh, we were in Madison, Wisconsin, maybe... 10 years ago, I don't know, something like that, and doing a Friday night in Encounter God, and the leader says, you can do anything you want to do. Okay, I said, I want to tell stories. So I took this book, and I have some PowerPoint, and I showed stories, and I told stories, and between every story, I says, let's just love Jesus like, like there's no tomorrow. Let's just fall in love with just, oh, Jesus, you're the best ever. I mean, just like a little child. I just want to crawl up in your lap. I want to hug you. I want to dance with you and just fall in love with Jesus. I'm not talking about nice little Christian words. I'm talking about activating our heart. What we really know to be true and in our best days, it's really alive. Well, call it up. Let's go after it. The cool thing is many times, not always, but many times when you do that, more fun stuff happens. And uh, I think Jesus just likes it when we talk about it. Would you guess? Would you figure? Yeah. I think so. So during the service, I said, keep your eyes open. At the end of the service, we didn't see anything. So I said, well, let's pray for healing. Anybody need healing? A few people stood up. And, of course, we do body ministry style. One little 70-year-old Filipina uh, widow woman, 70 years old, very poor. She was a cook in the YWAM at the YWAM base in Madison, Wisconsin. And she'd always wish she could go on a mission trip, but didn't have any money to go on a mission trip. She was praying. They were praying for something for her, and I don't even know what that was because I wasn't praying for her. She had her hands like this, and she said, I just felt like I was supposed to open it up. And when she did, there was a gold flake in her hand, about one-eighth inch square, and had ruffles, like ruffles potato chips on it. And uh, it's like she looked at it, and the person's praying for it, looked at it, and everybody says, hey, look, I think we got something here, you know. Now, she's innocent as it comes, you know. She's just a little widow lady, 70 years old. And so everybody started coming around, wanted to see what it was. I don't know if it was gold or not, but it does not matter to me. It might have been plastic. I don't care. But it came there supernaturally, and it was a sign. What do signs do? Make you wonder. They make you like, God, I don't know. This is cool. And when people rallied around, I was in charge I had the microphone, and I know nobody said anything about her finances. And to my knowledge, I didn't know that anybody even knew her. When they walked up to her, 
for some strange, mysterious reason, they all got out their billfolds and they started throwing cash at her feet. For five, six feet around, there was green cash all the way around. $480, something like that. Well, that's pretty cool, right? That's cool enough story. We could camp around that. It'd be good enough to tell that story, right? But there's a whole lot more. Talking about supernatural provision, so it ties in. So that, rest, that next week, she just stole, told the stories, and every time she did, she was all melted down, her tears, and like, God's so good, you know. And the crazy thing was, for some strange reason, she began getting some support from different people. Now, I didn't talk about it. Nobody talked about her. She didn't get up and share the testimony. I've been wanting to go on missions. Nobody knew anything about her that I knew of. Money kept coming in, coming in, coming in. She had enough to go on her first missions trip to Africa and India. She preached her first sermon. Her first people got saved. She was so excited to go to another village, and more people got saved. She came home, and guess what? More people kept giving her money. So she went to the Philippines to preach her own people, and they got saved. She came home, and by this time, now it's a year and a half, and I saw her at a conference. And I said, Rufina, Rufina, I keep telling your story about the gold flake. Do you still have it? She opened up her Bible to Isaiah. says, Behold, and this is the verse that we'd measured on that night. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. She had taped it right there. She says, there it is. Yeah, the picture's in that folder somewhere. And uh, she says, Mark, here's the rest of the story. When you left, the people gave me money and kept, give, kept giving me money, and I've never asked for money be, since then. And she says, there's more, enough money. I'm going back to the Philippines a second time to preach to my people again. Is that crazy? So the sign was cool. The $480 was cool. Are we going to stop there? No, it changed everything in her life. It changed her whole MO. The, the woman who was down in a small little box now became this happy camper. She's walking on the nations of the earth. She's on Facebook. It took me a few years later, I decided I was going to write um, on my blog and tell the story. And I had to search for her. I called to Madison and I, whatever. Finally found her. She's married. She is one happy camper. So I posted after getting her permission. And she says, she got on, there's a story. And she comments, says, yes, this is the coolest story ever. And that's only part of the story. So guys and gals, God wants to do crazy stuff. Bust us out of small thinking. We're like, we just live hand to mouth. Well, I'll just be a nice little cook. And a nice little, well, nothing wrong with that. Be faithful where you are. And as I said over James, you're faithful in little. I'll give you authority over much. So I love signs. Look around for signs this morning, all right? I'm not, I can't make them happen, but it's fun when God does, okay? So, oh, okay. So we have, uh, we sang a little bit about heaven. This morning, I think it was in the second song. What was that line? I want to just reference that again. Uh, where's Corey? By the way, good job, buddy. Good job. Thank you. Uh, what was that line? In, uh, anyway, my point, my thought went to um, mostly we are preoccupied with our address being earthbound. I'm an earthling. I'm a human. I'm a clay pot. You know, treasure in this earthen vessel. And so I'm just dust. And so someday I'll be something else. And maybe I'll go to heaven. That's kind of our Christian catchphrase. Go to heaven. You're going to go to heaven? You know you're going to go to heaven? But could I present to you the possibility that maybe we're already in heaven and just don't really know it? How about Colossians 3 verse 1 says, Since, it says, if then you have been raised, which is rhetorical, which means since then you have been raised. And you're now seated with Christ in heavenly places and hidden with Christ in God. I'm mixing Ephesians and Colossians together. You don't live on the earth anymore. You're not a mere earthling. And I'm not trying to say for us to somehow just believe, well, spiritually, I'm kind of there. And, you know, but, you know, mostly I'm still a human. And someday I'll be mostly over there. What are we going to do with the verse in John 3 where Jesus said, who is he who ascended? But he who descended, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Crazy language, kind of enigmatic, kind of a little bit confusing. Let's, un let's unpack it a little bit. 
Jesus is saying, he's talking to Nicodemus and all the boys. Gather around, boys, I'm going to tell you something. He says, uh, let me tell you about this guy who has ascended into heaven. And by the way, that's the same guy who descended from heaven. Who was it that descended from heaven? Exactly. Now he says, now just in case you're not sure who I'm talking about, it's the Son of Man, moi, who is, is, you catch that word is, is in heaven. Wait a minute, Jesus. This is pre-cross. In other words, he hadn't ascended, been glorified, and all the stuff that the cross afforded and the resurrection afforded for him. But he says before cross that he's already in heaven. I believe Bill Johnson says it this way, so I'll quote him. He says, Jesus is ultimate or pure theology. He's a, he's, he's, if you, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So you want to know what's true. Then just listen to Jesus and watch Jesus. Whatever he says and whatever he does, that's what's good for you and me. In fact, he says, I'll do the low-level stuff, and you'll do the greater stuff. You good with that? That's, that's just not what we grew up on, was it? Unless you got saved last week, and he's been preaching it here. <laughs> no, we didn't grow up on that. We didn't grow. Uh, the good stuff was relegated to Jesus doing it. And then we beg him and ask him to do the stuff again. But we don't see ourselves as the possessors, as the administrators of the heavenly stuff. Jesus said it, I want you to do the greater stuff. Yeah, so could I present to you that you and I are really already in heaven if we could believe it? If we could, believe, if we could just take the word of God. God. Which is more true? Your circumstances and your feelings or the Word of God? Uh, uh, okay, the Word of God. Right? Now you say that and how's that work when we're driving down the road or lay your head on a pillow? Boy, we got, I tell people, uh, we have two, um, two MOs, two operating systems that we work with. One is our good theology. Well, we got good theology. I got my favorite verses, and we speak those. And the other one is our self-talk. In other words, what I say to myself and kind of ruminate, what kind of rumbles through my mind about my poor perspective of myself. And I let that dictate to me what my identity is, rather than allowing the Word of God establish who I am. We're pretty ravaged, may I say, ravaged with sin consciousness. In other words, conscious of our sin. And thus, if we're sin conscious, then we have to somehow manage that sin. Oh, I sinned again. That's horrible. I probably really disappointed Jesus. <laughs> Father, he's, he's like, did you do that again? And so I'll go out, as I said earlier in the service, I'll go out in the back 40, hang out, hang out a while till the dust settles, and then maybe when, you know, things kind of cool a little bit, I can come back in and kind of tiptoe in. I won't come in like in a flurry. And by, by the way, I won't ask for a lot because I know I really, <laughs> man, do I know I don't deserve it. <laughs> and so we manage just a ton of CPU time processor time, managing our sin consciousness, trying to get ourselves somehow in good graces. When the Bible says that you and I are the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, do you think that that is pronounced over us just because somehow we got really, 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 really good enough that he could call us that? Or is it that it's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And it's by grace through faith you're saved, and it's not works of free gifts, but then he should boast, right? Now we know that, but how well are we doing when we think about our address? In other words, where I live, who I am, what's my perspective of myself? How well are we doing? Are we having a victory over that area? Can we shoot the devil right between the eyes with, about those thoughts? 
Here comes the condemner, the accuser of the brethren, and he wants to say, ah, 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 I, you did it again, didn't you? You see, God has got a perspective of us that is so much bigger and so much better than we could ever believe. And as much as we've got some really cool current theology that is just really mm, gripping our hearts and we love it, I think it's abundantly above all we could ask or even imagine. How much can you imagine? Ha, <laughs> way beyond that. You ready? I know our hearts say yes, but our minds are needing to be renewed. It's, it's, Revela I'm sorry, it's Romans 12, verse 2. So don't be conformed to this world's thinking. Don't let your mind be dictated and indoctrinated and terrorized by this world's cultural norm, but rather be transformed by getting a new mind. Where do we get a new mind? The only place I know, the best place. So, as I said earlier, uh, we just got to go ahead and let our mind get marinated. You like the word marinate? Marinate has some really good feelings and vibes to it, doesn't it? You got, anybody got marinated steak or chicken or something waiting at home? <laughs> Are you getting some good vibes? Your grill, you're going to turn that on, you know, and you heat it up, and woo, that smell. You know what barbecue's like. You get marination going on. How do you like that word? Marination going on, our minds getting renewed, and thus we get transformed. We get, ooh, how about this, caught up, caught up, caught up from earthly thinking, from earthly address, ever to live with him in the air of, ah, I am in heaven. By the way, how do you go to heaven? Don't you have to die to go to heaven, right? Well, didn't you already die? For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Well, maybe you've already passed that doorway. Maybe you already accomplished that threshold. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> That's, it's kind of stretching a little bit. I'm telling you, I believe it's more true than we can possibly kind of stretch or muster. Could I believe that, God? Yes. Yes, if Jesus said, I am in heaven now, then I think it's license for you and I to believe that we're in heaven now. What would that do to us? What would that do? How would it transform us if you really saw yourself as a heavenly being mostly? Yes, you still have feet that walk on terra firma. Yes, you have bills to pay. Yes, you have relationship issues. But your primary identity... Your primary operating system is derived from another realm. And you think from there. In fact, you're so, you're so indoctrinated, so brainwashed, if I could say it in a crass way, with the word of God that you think of yourself, you think of life, let me put it this way, you think of problems in life, not from the position of lack, but from the position of abundance. Like, God, you know I got bills. I don't, I'll never pay them. I'll never pay them. You've got to come through, God. God, i got to. The factual fervent prayer of the righteous man will make you relent. And I'm just going to be knocking on heaven's door until you. That's a mind of lack. It's a mindset of lack. How about if you get on the other side? Remember, you live in heaven. And you're on this side. Wow, Jesus. I see down there in terra firma, we got some issues. But I am a raised and co-seated saint, son. You have elevated me and exalted me to a position right alongside you. Seated with Christ in heavenly places. I am not in any way diminishing the Godhead, but neither do I want to diminish my identity. I want to just believe the word. So what does that mean? Jesus, you said it is finished on the cross. Another passage says, take every thought captive. I would like to kind of, my humanness, my mind wants to sink over here and do this lack thing, but I'm going to take every thought, thought captive and I'm going to subject it to the obedience of Christ. In other words, Jesus, what did you do in your obedience on the cross? You afforded for me everything pertaining to life and godliness, and then you said it's finished. So now I want to think from terms of abundance. That means, God, you've got an amazing answer to that problem. 
I don't know what it is right now, but it's going to be a cool journey. We're going to have an awesome, good time walking this out. I am not allowing my mind to get into fear. By the way, do you know where fear comes from? Because you don't know the love of God. Perfect love casts that stuff out. And so when we know the love of God, we can stand here, sit here, rest here, and do battle here into earthly situations. So now our perspective is not from earth to heaven. Please, God, someday will you? Could you? It's like, God, this is amazing. You've given me authority. I'm getting the mind of Christ. And you said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracle of God. So now I'm going to speak down into those earthly situations. I'm not an earthling anymore. That's, well, I have feet that walk on earth. But my primary identity, my address, is heavenly places. So now I speak from that as one who is not only co-crucified, co-buried, co-resurrected, co-raised, co-seated, co-heir, but co-ruler. Romans 5, 17, that you would reign in this life by the one Christ Jesus. Reign in this life, not later somewhere in the millennium or in heaven, you know, heaven after you die, but right now in this life. Daniel 7, I think it's verse 23, 28, somewhere in there. It says, this is where we're going, okay, and this is a big junk. I tell you, this will almost choke you. And it almost choked me, but it, it's amazing. It says, And that the greatness of all the kingdoms under all the heavens. Let's stop right there. How many kingdoms are under the heavens? There's a lot of them, right? A lot of kingdoms. And the greatness of all those kingdoms. I, I'm not sure what that means, but it, it's kind of like getting a hold of the whole enchilada. And all of those that are under the heavens shall be given into the hands of the saints. You and I are going to have to break off some old mentality if we're going to be able to be executives. Executives. Executives over the kingdoms of this earth. Because most of us struggle with poor little old me syndrome. And my sin management and sin preoccupation issues. So if we're going into, as I mentioned earlier, some kingdom influence, kingdom awareness, kingdom activity age, then you and I are going to have to get rid of our little old me mentality. We're going to have to believe that God really is a better than God, better than we ever thought. And then guess what? I might be more than I ever thought. You know, Scripture, I understand, Scripture says, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought. But neither do you want to think less of yourself than you ought. Either one of those are ditches on either side of the road. So, okay, God, you said I am. I am what you said I am. Everybody say that with me. I am what you said I am. One more time. I am what you said I am. Maybe that's where Popeye got it. Anyway, you know, I guess God said that first, didn't he? Back at the burning bush. Anyway, uh, so let's just take a few things here. By the way, there's a book for each of you, families, and uh, a CD back there that uh, is designed to make you cry. Not because the music's so bad, the music's good. It's because they're love songs to Jesus that will hopefully put words to the passions you'd like to say, but you're fumbling for words. So be careful. You might not want to drive while you're listening to it. Adam was driven from the garden, and then he was pronounced, a curse was pronounced over him. He would till the ground among thorns and thistles and sweat of his brow. Now that is very different. It's got to be very distinctly different from his activity in the garden. We do know that in the garden, he tended the garden. That's biblical language. But that cannot be equated with tilling the ground among thorns and thistles by the sweat of your brow. So whatever he did in the garden, whatever tending means, which we don't know too much, except for he named the animals. That's about all we know. That sounds like fun stuff to me. But whatever that was, this was contrastly, contrasted uh, from you know, 180 degrees. 
And that has become the status quo, the gold standard for the way we make money nowadays. Uh, the cool thing is that in, in judgment, God says, I'm going to make mercy triumph over judgment. I'm always going to make a way for you to make it, to somehow escape the judgment. I'm going to give you a way. So he says, if you work hard for 40 hours a week, till the ground or whatever you do, I'll put beans on the table and you can feed the people, feed your family. So even atheists, even those who are rebellious to God, God says, if you use my principles, they work. Isn't that big heart of, of him? He, gives, he lets his, his principles work even if you don't like him. Isn't that amazing? God's just an amazing God. So here we are tilling the ground, and we've learned that in culture. Uh, we're 6,000 years past that time when it was pronounced upon Adam, and we still practice it. We preach it out in the church. I'm sorry, out in the world, and we even preach it in the church. But let's just take, for instance, for a moment, what happened with Jesus at the cross. So here's Jesus. He comes on the cross. We know that he took on the curse and became the curse so that you and I don't have to suffer the consequences of our own sin. Is that correct? Okay. So the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and Jesus took the wages of sin, which is death, upon himself. He died on the cross. And thank you, Jesus. Awesome. Now, that was a big deal for him, and for us, it's kind of a position of faith. It's our theology. Uh, we quote it, and, but, you know, it's kind of ethereal. You can't, like, get a hold of it. It's like, right there it is. You know, let me measure it. Let me, you know, quantify it, and, uh, you know, let me show it to you, and I don't mean, like, show you in a word. You can't just hold something up, like pictures in that book I'm sitting around. You can't really do that. It's kind of ethereal stuff. Well, let me ask you the question. When Jesus came to earth and took on the curse, did he take on just part of the curse or all of the curse? You might know I'm going to push you a little bit, squeeze you in a corner with this. I think he took on all the curse, not just the wages of sin, which are the consequences of, of our sin, the curse, but I think he took on all of the curse. In fact, remember till the ground among thorns and thistles by the sweat of your brow. Remember that? What did Jesus wear on his head, on his brow? A crown of thorns. I wonder if, perchance, outside chance, if that's symbolic, has any relevance. Have any relevance at all? That was 2,000 years ago, guys, and we're still largely living under the same curse that Adam did. We still do the same thing. We've not appropriated the breakthrough, the freedom that was given to us, afforded to us by Jesus. Huh. And there we go. We just keep going through life and just kind of, uh, just kind of doing our, our thing. So you say, well, Mark, I don't know. Can you give me some examples of how we could recapture, how we could reclaim something that's in the Bible, but... You know, we haven't seen it in our lives. Okay, since you ask. Uh, in the 1900s, we saw four or five major revelations come to pass, come to be revealed, and then become fairly commonplace in the body of Christ. One of them is, in the early 1900s, we saw the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We got uh, Azusa, we've got Wichita, Topeka, we've got Wales, and several other places that baptism of the Holy Spirit was... Uh, emerged and became uh, expressed on the earth largely through some individuals who were desperate to find a breakthrough in God. I read a biography about Frank Bartleman. He was so gripped, and he was from Azusa Street, and before Azusa broke out, he was so gripped, he'd go to this group and that group, and he says, I don't see it anywhere, what I'm seeing in here, and I want it. And he began to fast, and his wife says, if you don't stop fasting, you're going to die. He says, I'll die if I don't. How bad do you want the things that are in here? How much does your heart hunger for it? Do you burn for it? Is your heart like Jesus uh, 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 consume a zeal for your father's house? I don't mean for these four walls. I'm talking for the truth, the heart of what he wants to release in the earth. Does your heart grip for it? Are you willing to pay the price not only for yourself, but for your friends, for your family, for your society? 
Well, a few people did with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and nowadays we see it fairly common. Even if they don't believe it, they got a lot of tolerance for it in other churches. And then we saw salvation. In the early 1900s and previous, we didn't have the assurance for salvation. We thought it was possible, but we weren't guaranteed. So we came up to mourner's benches and we cried out maybe two weeks in a row, scream, wail, and whatever, to get a breakthrough. We wanted to break through. That was kind of a key word, breakthrough. And so maybe perchance we could get saved. But unfortunately in those days we were not sure but what we could lose that salvation in the next week and have to repeat the process. But now we're really confident that we can have the assurance of salvation. Believe in your heart, confess through your mouth, believe in your heart, and thou shalt be saved. That's pretty simple, guys. Somebody start believing that, start, start proclaiming it to us. And okay, we're buying in. The word of God is true. It's truer than my feelings. See how we're doing it? We're having to come to terms with, is this true or is it not? And it is true. How about, how about healing? In the early 1900s up to mid-1900s, their tent meeting revivalist. And if you wanted to be healed, you had to go to a faith healer. And a lot of healings happened. Jack Coe, Ailey Allen, uh, T.L. Osborne, uh, Oral Roberts, uh, William Branham, you know, and, uh, and just a, a ton of guys. And my father was, of course, uh, a contemporary, and he went to see most of those guys, as did Debbie's father. So they created a great heritage for us, a launching pad. But the truth is, a long time ago, a guy in the 80s by the name of John Wimber and said, when do we get to do this stuff? Why is it only relegated to a few faith guys, big guys, big dogs? He said, I want to do this stuff. He says, I prayed for a thousand people before I got my first healing. How's that working for you? Something stirring, like, God, I'm going after this stuff. How about prophetic? See, back in, I remember in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, Debbie, my preaching is not that bad. <laughs> this is her second time, and, well, probably about her hundredth or thousandth time. But anyway, she's a good woman. I love her. And uh, so the prophetic, you know, uh, if you wanted to be prophesied over, you had to go to prophetic people, such as William Branham. And along came the prophetic movement and movements in the 80s. And we started be beginning to believe 1 Corinthians 14, which says you can all prophesy. And now we pretty much, I imagine most of you have, have stepped into that and given prophetic words. And Pat and others, or you're raising up prophetic teams. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's a truth that was in the Bible since Jesus' day. Of course, it was there in the heart of God forever. And the truth is, any individual could get anything in God's heart, regardless of timing, if they wanted to go after it. But the cool thing is, when it's a corporate or global timing, it gets poured out on all of humanity, maybe by a few who pay the price, but it's God's epic timing. Guess what? It's like a wave to a surfer. Now I don't have to work so hard. I catch the wave and, whoa, this is so much more easy because you're on this epic or this global outpouring of grace that God's doing in the earth. I think that's the case. God is restoring to us revelations that have been hidden even though they've been in plain sight in front of us. But they've been hidden from us. Some, nobody declared them to us. How shall the people know unless the preacher preaches? You know, the trumpet makes a clear sound. How shall we know? Well, God is revealing it to a few to clarion call over the many, and we're beginning to believe it. Is that cool? I think God is doing that for me. He's helping me to find a position of faith that's worked in our lives. Debbie and I have not had outstanding debt, except for mortgage, for about 15 years. We've not had credit card debt, car debt, any kind of debt, personal debt of any kind. We pay off a credit card every, week, every month. And so no debt of any kind except for mortgage for 15, for 15 years until this year. In February, somebody emailed me and said, uh, Mark, how much do you owe on your mortgage? Ah, I think it's a paid down to about 11200 He says, cool. He says, I want to pay that off so you don't have to think about your mortgage anymore. Guess what? I'm debt-free completely. 
Is that cool? The cool thing is, I never go out and ask for money. I never talk about money. I don't take out offerings. We give away all of our product. This cost me $5 a book. Our CDs cost roughly 60 cents, something like that. Uh, and so we give it all away. We give away all of our... Oh, they're, they're still looking at us. <laughs> we give away all of our product, all of our time. We travel around the world, almost never talk about money anywhere we go unless they bring it up. The cool thing is, like, for instance, here's my book. I gave it some church out, and I never met this guy, a pastor out in uh, Virginia. Uh, he called me up. He says, Mark, I want this book. I read it, and it's revolutionary. I want to give it to my whole church. Can you send me a box? I said, sure. How much it cost? I said, well, pay the postage. 20 bucks to send a box of 50 or something like that. I sent it to him. I never thought a thing about it. I don't care anymore. I just really don't care. You cannot outgive God. You can't. I know that preaches well, but it experiences well. It's real. It really happens. Well, the thing went on and on and on, maybe a year or two later, and the guy called me up and says, call me, I got something to tell you. We've had a major windfall breakthrough in our church for a corporate church and many people in the church. He says, I want to send you $1,000. He did. Awesome. Well, that way more than paid for the books. Guess what? See, God just wanted to get me freed up in the mind. So I don't think, okay, I did A plus B equals C. You get the books, but you got to pay me. And so he says, oh, that sounds kind of tough. And by the way, how could you ever sell this book? That'd be the dumbest thing ever. I'm going to tell you about supernatural provision. Pay me $16.95. How could you sell the heart of God? How could you sell a gift that's given to you? Especially with that title. And so the cool thing is, you just can't outgive God. God comes, back, comes through so wildly. I was telling the first group, so when I had to buy the last thousand books of a $5,000 contract on my first contract with these books, with the publisher, and so it's about $5,000, and we didn't have the money, and I had to fulfill my contract. Well, yeah, so, so 5,000 books, $5 a book is 25000 you know, it's like, uh, that's a fun story, but I'm trying to cut it a little short here. And so we're up to needing another $5,000. And I said, we don't have that. And somewhere along the line, we have a direct bank deposit in our bank, of course. And I said, what is that? $5,200. Now, Debbie, woman of faith that she is, she's, oh, well, that's God's way to provide for the books. Great. You know, and I'm saying, ah, we just don't get that kind of deposit in our bank. You know, let me check that out. And I checked it out. It was from a royalty distribution company. I said, wait a minute, we don't get royalties like that. And so I looked it up, and it was a secular band. I think it was a rock band. And they had two songs, and it had the titles of the songs. I'd never heard the band or the songs. And I said, oh, Debbie, that, that money's not ours. I said, you've got to give it back. But we kept it in our bank because we didn't know where to send it. But we didn't, pay, we didn't uh, spend it. She sent an email and sent a phone call, and no answer. A couple months later, now we really need books because people are asking for them. We get an email from the manager of the distribution part of this company. He says, yeah, I'm the manager. Ah, uh, yeah, it's right. You brought the to our attention. We made a mistake and mispaid you. And uh, glad you brought it up. People don't normally tell us when we pay them wrongly. But he says, we don't have a way to receive back erroneously paid monies. So no further response necessary on your part. How do you do business like that? So that's pretty good, right? We can stop there, right? That's good enough to tell that story. But it gets better. Second paragraph says, but furthermore, we passed the fourth quarter pay period, and in two weeks or three weeks, there'll be another 600 and some dollars come to you. And again, no further response necessary. I would have just put a stop payment on that thing, you know? <laughs> What's wrong with you, you know? But of course, I didn't say that to him because... I just love the ingenious of God. He is so cool that he helps make provision, listen to this, outside of the sweat zone. Remember, that was the curse. We didn't sweat for this. So this gets, these stories get so cool. Like, that was one of my cooler stories. And by the way, at the end of every chapter, we have testimonies. And then I have a whole chapter of testimonies. And so just this week, or actually, yeah, this, this past week, 
So we got a check in the mail from a foundation that handles distribution of estates and trusts and different things like that. In the 90s, we lived in Wisconsin. We had invested in church about an hour away, and many times we'd served in that church and done ministry. And to my knowledge, I don't know that they ever gave us an honorarium, but we'd never asked for any, and we never really thought about it. They might have given us pizza money once in a while, you know what that is, just enough to buy pizza to get home. And that's totally cool, many times. That was just all we have, and I said, well, Lord, uh, the Bible says with food and raiment be there with content, or happy campers. By the way, that is your bottom line. I talk about that very seriously. Uh, would you pull up that uh, graphic with the little man climbing the mountain? Look at this. So the vertical line is our standard of living. The horizontal line at the bottom is our path in life, our progress in life. So this is a little man. We're climbing our attainments, the things that we gain, giftings, skills, positions, relationships, anointings, whatever. By grace, we might come up to a certain line, but then there's something in maybe our humanness that's like, I want more. Now, I'm not talking about the godly wanting more. I'm talking about human aspirations, worldly goals. And so we continue to go on up the mountain, on up the mountain in our own strength. Do you know the Bible said in John 4, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the Father. So anything up to that second horizontal line, he said, when you do that, it'll be food to you. In other words, I'll take over everything inside of that area. But when you go above that area, you get to do that all by yourself. You want a biblical example? Jonah. Uh-uh, I ain't going to Nineveh. I'm going down to Joppa. And I'm going to get myself a boat ticket. And the Bible says, and he paid for his own fare, quote verbatim. When you do your own thing, you get to pay for it. And when you say uncle, and by the way, that's by default when you got to, how about if you proactively like, Jesus, whatever. When you do it his way, then he pays for the uh, oceanic fare. He's got special transportation. Perfectly suited to give you a little time to process. And you'll travel along and travel along and he'll keep it going, keep you alive, sustain you, no problem. And then, boop, up on the shore and you're off and running. <laughs> yes, sir, Jesus. Hopefully your hearts are not resistant at that point. Below the line, he pays the fare. That's the takeaway phrase on this book on the back page. It says, God's will is God's bill. Anything in his will he pays. Anything in your will, you get to pay. Fun, fun, fun. Yeah? The one above requires sweat. Working our fingers to the bone. Nervous, anxiety, stress, stewing, and whatever. The one below, you get to enter into rest. So somewhere along the line, we might come to a moment of reckoning. Okay, God, okay, okay, okay. I'm kind of tired of sweat. How do we get that reckoning? How do we come to that moment? Sometimes uh, we run into a brick wall. We had a young man living with us the last six months, kind of a renegade, kind of a maverick, and he got in trouble, and so he came and lived with us, and about two months into it, he hit another brick wall. Not for me, but I was there to help Jesus a little bit. <laughs> he had a come-to-Jesus moment in the absolute sense of the word. Gave his heart to the Lord, got saved, tears, bona fide, sincere, going for Jesus. And uh, sometimes we have the moment of reckoning. What is that? Relationship breakdown? Financial failure? Whatever. Hope not. It doesn't have to be. God doesn't want it that way. No way. That's not his first choice. First choice is he leads us with his eye, like, you know, over there. <laughs> and then it's whistle. The Bible actually says in one case he whistles for his kids. Another one says he whispers, still small voice. Conscience. How loud does his voice have to be before we say, ah, okay. We don't need two befores, do we? No. No, no. <laughs> Wrong answer. Wrong answer. No two befores for this group. No, we're going after it proactively, which, by the way, 
This and really every other thing pertaining to and regarding God is we can either do it by default or proactively. In other words, yeah, yeah, you might be of sound mind and full strength right now, but one of these days, given normal course of life, you're probably not going to be as mobile as you have always been. Now, I don't think that's God's assignment. I just think that's kind of the commentary on humanity right at this stage of history. But somewhere we're probably not going to be as mobile and we can't work for a living. Guess what? By default, you're going to have to come back. God, you've got to support me. Why not be proactive? Why not do it on purpose? Why not like some of you went to college? Two, four, six, eight, ten. If you're a specialist in something, you might have gone eight or ten or twelve years. Because you wanted something. You wanted a degree, so the credentials that give you empowerment to walk out into something in life, some area in life. What if you did this, going after learning who the, what the goodness of God is, the generosity of our Father, and the, your personal identity, and begin to learn how to hear His voice, which, by the way, you go to my website, my blog, and I got an, in an ironclad way, it works 100% for us, how to find the will of God. Got your interest? Well, then go there. Go to my business card back there. It's on that CD. And you type in fleece template in, on my blog, and it'll take you to it. It works all the time. We do all the great. Beyond the map blog right there, you type in fleece template. I'm telling you, it'll give you an ironclad way. You got to mean business with God, though. You got to get ruthless with yourself. You got you to shoot down those kind of spurious, warm, fuzzy thoughts. You got to get hard and down and dirty with your thinking. I don't mean dirty, but you're real serious about it. You got to go after it. And so I don't know where I was with all that. Oh, in the foundation story, yes. See, it's a team effort here. And then I've got to, and then I've got to wrap this up. And so uh, this week, after seven years of paying us maybe about $7,000, that stopped maybe eight or ten years ago. We haven't heard boo from them. Everything was completed as far as we're concerned. This week, we got a check for $6,200 from, uh, from that foundation. Like, I read the form letter. I still can't understand it. But you know what? It's got my name right there on the check. And this time, I'm going to receive it with gladness. <laughs> and so thank you, Jesus. So what I want to do is do one last thing. Do I, can I have some help here? Uh, James, you're an amazing guy. You might get some help. Pass one coin out to everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about Matthew 17. It's, yeah, I think you've got enough for... Uh, I think there's enough for everybody in here. So... Uh, Matthew 17, and this is one of the chapters in my book. It's the, it's the story of Jesus and Peter going into the temple. Now, they go into the temple, and the temple guys say, well, Peter, does your master pay temple tax? Now, guys, don't get distracted with them, okay? They'll, kind of, they'll get around to you, all right? <laughs> Peter, does your master pay temple tax? Peter's like scratching his head. Uh, Jesus, do we pay temple tax? Uh, yes, we do, and that's a terrible system. Why should the fathers tax the son? That is so terrible. But nevertheless, today we're not going to bloody noses. So, uh, but now listen, ask, uh, let me know if this is the correct version. Uh, but Peter, you know, we haven't got any money, and I forgot my checkbook. And they don't have ATMs where we live right now. So uh, why don't you go get an extra job? Uh, you know, we haven't worked for a while, but if you rally the guys and get all the boats and the nets and you go out fishing for a couple of nights, we'll have enough money and we can pay the temple taxes and then, hey, we'll splurge on Saturday night. We'll all go to movies. Does that sound like Jesus? That's not exactly the correct version? Okay, no, it's not. Well, it goes more like this. Peter, what have we been doing over the last year or so? Ah, Jesus, we've been out on the gospel trail. Just doing the ministry and doing stuff. And well, what are we doing? Oh, raising the dead and cleansing the leper and blind eyes seeing. Jesus said, you like that? Oh, man, it's so much better than fishing. Jesus says, yeah, we've been about our father's business. And you know what? Here's the cool thing. John later on is going to write it in John 4 that uh, our food is to do the will of the father. In other words, as we're doing the will of the father and just making his joy to be my joy, then guess what? He says, the Father will take care of all, remember below the, below the line? 
you know, take care of everything because God's will is God's will. So guess what? Today is not about getting an extra job. You got surprise taxes to pay, guys, at tax time? Peter didn't go. Jesus didn't say go get extra job. Jesus says enter into rest. Now today what I want you to do, Peter, is I want you to go home, get your rod and reel, and then on your way down to the lake, I want you to go by Starbucks and get a big iced coffee. And you're going to go down there, and I know you, Peter, you're, you're, you're going to try to make this thing work, but here's the deal. You're going to go fishing, and I want you to cast in a hook. Remember those words, because that's exactly what the Bible says. Now, I studied it. The money they owed was four days' wages. So when you cast in a hook, you are not going to make four days' wages with a hook. So Jesus telling Peter to fish was not going to get a vocation vocational paying job. That's not what it was about. It's about him, listen to this, going back to what he enjoyed as a child, where he had joy in living. Where he'd lost joy, his joy had become a job. And now he'd constrained others into it. Now it's a job for everybody. Let's just make a happy world out of this, you know? And Jesus is like, no. Let's go back to where you had joy, and I'm going to make a miracle where you used to have joy. So Peter, you're going to lay there, and I want you to relax. I know you're going to watch that little bobber out there, and it ain't going down. You're going to run around here and here and there. Stop. This is about entering into rest today. At the end of the day, or somewhere along the line, you're going to catch a fish, and in that fish's mouth is going to be a gold coin. Peter's like, okay, Jesus, I got it. So he goes down and does his thing, and he's sitting there. He's tempted. Oh, that bobber is not going down. But Jesus told me to enter into rest, so... He leaned his head up against a log and a gentle lapping of the waves and pretty soon falls asleep, sees the puffy clouds go by. Oh, you know what? I do love this life with Jesus. It's the best. He wakes up about that time, plunk, down goes the bobber and Peter's reeling it in and it's like, great, 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 this is awesome. He opens up, take the hook out and there's a coin in there. I've got to tell Jesus. Oh, that's right. He already knew about that. He quick, he throws that rod and reel down and he runs down to Jesus. Look at here, Jesus, you wouldn't believe. Well, I guess you would. And so Jesus says, yeah, it's how good our father is. When you and I find our pleasure at being about our father's pleasure, when we, our minds have been corralled, trained, begin to find joy at doing what brings him joy. This is not a sowing and reaping thing. This is just, uh, I just like being with you. I just want to be where you are, dwelling daily in your presence. Jesus said, yeah. When that gets worked good and deep, when that gets worked in there and infiltrated in where you're not always trying to exact something out. Well, I gave you something, you give me something, you know. And I, I, oh, that's hard life. When you start getting simple, like, a little child except you become like one of these little kids. You can't even get in the kingdom. So we become like a little child, and Peter's like, I think I'm getting it, Jesus. Yeah, he fell back a few more times later on, you know. But I think he went down and plunked that, that gold coin in the coffers of the temple. There you go. And he took that fish home, and he and Mrs. Peter had the best fish dinner ever. And they live happily ever after. And what's the moral of that story? Careful, this almost break your break logic. Got extra pax, uh, taxes to pay? Take a vacation. Guys, we're not talking about couch potatoes, eating bonbons, and vegging out. That's not what we're talking about. Jobs can be good. There can be kingdom uh, dynamics in jobs that are very, very, very valuable. The Bible says, let a, young, let a man bear the burden in his youth probably means get a job so that you get some character so that when you grow up, as you grow up, you have some character to put kingdom deposits in. You see? And so what are you going to do in a job? Consistency, faithfulness, stewardship, discipleship, either you discipling them or the days they're discipling you or enterprise creating something for other people to be discipled. And there could be a ton of reasons beyond income. The stress, stew, anxiety, stress, stress and stewing of, for, in, uh, for income. So find, find out what the Lord wants. 
live below that second line and watch him pay the bill. He'll do good for you. Take that, that coin out. It's a real live coin, real live one. Breathing, moving, no, not really, but it has more power in it than you could possibly imagine. This was given to me about 10 years ago by a guy. I was studying Matthew 17, and a day later, then I was really like, yes, God, this is cool. You supply supernatural provision, you know, and that's been worked in our life for quite a long time, but I just have another installment. The next day, I met this guy, and at the end of our conversation, we hadn't talked about finances at all. He reached in his pocket and pulled out two coins, two gold coins. This happens to be one of them. And he says, here, I think I'm supposed to give these to you. I said, that is amazing. It's because that's what, just what I studied about. I mean, I did research about it. And so I take this out. Every once in a while, Debbie says, well, we got some bills coming up. Am I going to get in lack or am I going to stay in abundance? Yeah. yeah? This coin is like, see the corner of this shirt right here? Like this is a, a shirt. It's a large. It might be extra large. I'm not sure. But this coin is like the, just the corner of that shirt. Just, it's just the smallest representation of the huge promise of provision that God is giving to us. And so I take this coin. And I say, wow, Jesus, I'm out of my prayer trail. Most of my prayer time, I like being out in a prayer trail. And I'm walking along. That's why you guys saw me pacing back there in the first service. I just like, oh, this is best. You know, it activates, engages all of me, my whole being. And so I pull it out and I say, Jesus, we got some bills down there in terra firma. You already knew about that before I did, didn't you? That is so cool. You know everything about my life. Past, present, and future. And you are so full of faith. And so I'm just going to get in that faith, stay in that faith. So I pull it out, and I do this like Jesus. That is such a big promise. I hold it out in front of me. Literally, I see it like a doorway. So sometimes I tend to like fall out of that doorway of faith, the room of faith, I tend to kind of fall out and get into this lack thing, you know? And so I hold it up, literally, I do this as I'm walking along. I say, Jesus, today, I'm walking right back in. There I am, Jesus. Okay. Now, that means between now and whenever the answers manifest, I am not asking you for another thing regarding that issue. Because you've already finished it. So now what I want to do is get into rejoicing, into thanking, into appreciative, into the excitement of the journey. What kind of story is that going to be, God? I don't know what you're going to do, but it's going to be another good one. We're going to chalk it up. Look what Jesus did again. This is going to be, you've done that so many times. Has anybody had any great breakthroughs from God? Four of you. Okay. <laughs> Jesus, you're going to have to help them. <laughs> Obviously, every one of us. But if we're not careful, we can lose that slip over here. But do business with that gold coin. And by the way, that's not yours to give away. So I, I bought many of them, and I gave them away. And uh, that's why, by the way, this gold coin is on the front. I, get, I bought many of my own money. I gave them away, and I was out in church maybe two years ago. And I was giving away a bunch of them, and afterwards a guy came up to me and says, how could I donate to your ministry? I said, well, there's PayPal or a check or I don't know, several different ways. He says, cool. I'm going to give you $1,000 so you can buy another 1,000 coins so you can give it to another 1,000 people. How amazing is God? He says, I got a job for you to do, and I'm going to pay the bill. You just be happy. You just give them away. Just forget about you being the originator of anything in this. Just be happy about doing my stuff, and I'll take care of it. Blow the line, right? God's will is God's will. Are you guys doing okay? Is your mind getting washed? The washing of the word. Now, part of it's the word of testimony, which you guys love testimony, because why? Testimony gives the license and possibility for it to happen again in our lives. And part of what I've been sharing, of course, is the word. I haven't quoted too many references, but you've probably recognized many of the exact verbatim out of the Word of God. And so with that, it's the washing of the Word until my mind gets renewed, and thus I get transformed. Guys, I know that uh, your pastor has shared uh, over the last three or four weeks, whatever it was, the, the getting free in our minds from 
the ravages and the power of the curse, the effects of the curse. And guys, it's really true. And there's so much more. I would love, I mean, this would just, I, I can't do this justice. It's just not even possible. Because it just requires, first of all, some teaching. And second of all, it just enjoys, or it just requires some uh, exuberance, getting ecstatic about it. Let me, let me tell you another story that proves that point, you know. And so, uh, I hope you've gotten something out of it. Doing okay? If you don't mind, put your hands on your head. Uh, yeah, we'll do this first. Lord, I just bless my mind to have renewed thoughts. Renewed thoughts. Uh, and God, when, when my circumstances and my feelings uh, get into an illegal, uh, inappropriate place, I'm not talking about sin here. I'm talking about unbelief and doubt and fear and anxiety and stress and stew and all those bad words, Jesus. When my mind wants to go there, uh, Lord, I just charge my mind to send off some red uh, flags and sirens and klaxons and whistles and say, uh, 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 uh. It's illegal. You can't go there. Mind I just charge you in Jesus' name. I'm going to begin taking every thought captive. And the ones that want to take me down and pull me into darkness and fear and unbelief, I just said, no more Jose. You know, we just bless my mind in Jesus' name to be established upon the word, washed by the washing of the word. Get regenerated and renewed, and thus my life be transformed. Hold your coin out. Lord, just thank you for promises that we can begin to use as tools to take us into new rooms and new places. Yeah, Lord, not only for our sakes only, but for our families, for those around us, for our culture, for our city. God, what would Warrensburg be like? God, if a few, if you could do it with 12, you lost one, 11, but Lord, if you could do it with 11 and build the early church on these 11 guys, later 12, or if you could do that with rough and tough guys, smelly fishermen, cheating taxpayers, tax, uh, tax gatherers, Republicans and Republicans, or whatever, if you could do it, Lord, with all those guys, Lord, I think you could do it with us. We take this coin, Lord, and just say, just one more installment of the grand promise of your goodness to us and your Je Jehovah Jireh care for us. Lord, we intend to walk into that faith room, that room of abundance. Our mind gets our new orientation, new address is the room of abundance, living in heavenly places. That's my first default thinking is, I'm a heavenly being. I live from abundance, and I speak down into earthly situations. Thank you, Lord, for every installment you give to make me be an overcomer, yea, even a co-reigner. Amen.